Well, welcome everybody to the uh, presentation that we're going to provide today. I want to talk about cross passage construction, keeping it safe. And so, our content today is we're going to first of all just hit the highlights of the principles of ground freezing and take a little bit of time talking about the frozen soil behavior and the specialized soil testing that we use in, for ground freezing projects. Then we're going to go into some discussion about the design of cross passages using the ground freezing method and how in constructing those cross passages. And then we're going to go into and talk about the monitoring and quality control that's, con you know, con that's necessary during construction for uh, safe success of these types of uh, projects. And then we'll talk about case histories and we'll wrap up with some conclusions. So the principles of ground freezing, which I'll go through fairly quickly, are, are, are fairly simple. Uh, many people don't realize that the principles were developed many, many years ago, in 1883 in Germany. And it was really first developed for deep coal mine shafts. And the, the deepest frozen shaft was occurred in the, uh, at Rheinberg in a depth of uh, over 600 meters. So it's certainly a technology that has been around for quite some time, uh, ever since refrigeration, really. So the principles of ground freezing are relatively straightforward. First of all, everything is about withdrawing the heat from the soil. And to do that, we install a freeze pipe Using, usually using conventional drilling or if we're going horizontally, some microtunneling techniques. And after we install a freeze pipe, we install a feed tube or an inner pipe inside of that freeze pipe. Now, the important thing about the outside freeze pipe is that is, uh, is contained. In other words, it's, uh, we do, do not allow the, the coolant to go into the ground itself. Then we you know, connect some lines up, and depending on whether we're using brine or we're using liquid nitrogen, we, you know, we charge the coolant lines, bringing the and brine temperature is typically down to about minus 38 degrees centigrade, and liquid nitrogen can go down as, as low as minus 60 degrees to 150 degrees centigrade. Of course, the difference between the brine and the uh, liquid nitrogen is the fact that the liquid nitrogen is exhausted or you consume the liquid nitrogen versus the brine, which is which is circulated in a closed circulation loop. And of course, once the brine or the nitrogen is circulating, the, uh, the, the ground freezes. That's the principles. So, Meredith, do we have any questions? We do. And the first question from our audience is, can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes. The, uh, the answer is yes. The, the, this webinar is being recorded, and within a few days of this uh, um, event, it will be available at tunnelingjournal.webex.com. Those of you who would like to get a copy of this. So. We'll have the results to the uh, polling question up in about 10 seconds. Okay, great. So we'll move on. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about frozen soil behavior and, and, the, and the strength of frozen soil is, is of course, what we're initially after. And uh, you know, it's commonly known, I think, that freezing will increase the strength and stiffness of the soil. So what you see here on the slide is a graph showing the relative strength of various materials versus temperature. And and also you see you'll get a, a sense for this how different soil types and strength vary with temperature. So the red line for example is what you the typical behavior you would see for uh, let's say a medium sand. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to note that the blue line at the bottom is is the blue, both blue lines at the bottom are pure ice. And so this gives you a relative feeling for how strong the, the you know, how strong you can uh, get a frozen soil. I just want to talk a little bit about the frozen soil properties and uh, um, especially um, unlike other materials 
that we deal with in geotechnical engineering and soil mechanics, one of the things that we have to pay attention to to frozen soil is its creep behavior. So here what you see is a, a standard plot of a laboratory test results showing uniaxial creep tests done at a minus 20 degrees centigrade in the laboratory. And what you see here is that you see you know, strain versus time. And so it's very important for us to understand the strength versus time and also to understand in a construction consideration when failure will occur because the, when the failure will occur will, will oftentimes dictate the strength that we need to design the structure for at that point in time. But this is a very important property of frozen soils that aren't you know, normally uh, associated with unfrozen soils, let's say. Of course, frozen soil behavior, you know, when you freeze the soil, it completely stops groundwater movement. So in the in when when you have flowing water, it has a it creates a, or provides a permanent heat source to the area you're trying to freeze. So when the velocity of groundwater is high, it can cause a very significant delay in the frost growth or even prevent the uh, frost closure from occurring. And uh, you can also have thermal erosion over time. So one of the most you know, important things that we do in site investigations is to understand how groundwater in the area to be frozen is moving and what, at what velocity. So what we do is we do specialized testing. Uh, CDN has its own laboratory where we do these tests. Uh, we have a refrigeration chamber. We're able to take soil samples and freeze them at temperatures from zero to minus 20 degrees centigrade. In this laboratory, we can run unconfined compression tests, triaxial compression tests, creek tests, etc. And so, the, what you're seeing here is a picture of in our frozen soil lab, uh, and we can test soil samples up to a force of up to 700 kilonewtons. And this is a, another photograph from our laboratory showing the test equipment for uniaxial creek tests. You can notice the uh, protective wear the, uh, the technician is wearing to maintain our, the, the laboratory at, at, the, at that cold temperature throughout the test. Here we're looking at some special soil testing. This is some showing the results of uniaxial compression tests. On the left-hand side, you see a peat specimen before testing. Now on the right hand side you see the peat specimen after failure. Now I think it's obvious to everybody that the peat, you know, wouldn't be that you know nice and sort of cylindrical here as shown in the left hand photograph. So uh, it does give you a sense for how the just freezing even a, a low strength material like peat uh, increases the strength. If we look at the behavior of of the under of frozen soil samples under uniaxial compressive trips, as, as shown here in this stress strain diagram. This also gives you an idea of the modulus values that we see for various materials. So what you see is a you know, one curve for a sand profile and one curve for peat and clay. It's interesting to note here the strain rates. You can see that as a peat sample at high strain rates can actually be much stronger or stronger than the clay, the clay sample at, at the same strain rates, whereas frozen sand, of course, is uh, you get a very high modulus value and a high strength at a low strain. When we evaluate our laboratory test results, we are looking at time-dependent frozen soil behavior. What we're trying to achieve in the laboratory is to get an estimate of what the strength of the material is going to be at and use the value at the time of, of, of failure or at the time that we're looking um, you know, for that strength. An example of that is if we know the frozen soil body needs to have a structural strength that has to last you know, up to, say, three months, then we would use a frozen soil strength associated with that time frame. It's very important to note here, if you look on this table, how with time, the values of modulus change, change, the compressive strength changes, and the cohesion changes. 
So it's very important in order to actually cal calculate a, uh, an adequate factor of safety that you understand the time frame that the construction will be carried out. I'd like to talk a little bit about the ground freezing design for our thermal design. Uh, we almost always run finite element calculations, and in these finite element calculations, and you'll see the results of these in, in, in a little bit, uh, we consider the soil layers. We start out with the initial temperatures in, in the soil layers. We look at freeze pipe spacing and freeze pipe temperatures. Um, and also, we have to calculate the freeze plant capacities for brine freezing. And then the other thing that we calculate with these um, calculations are looking at the intermittent, you know, freezing uh, during the maintenance stage, which is typically has a much lower uh, requirement for, you know, power and for maintenance. The other important consideration is the additional heat sources <laughs> or the thermal boundary conditions. And we'll be discussing these a little bit um, later on. So the results of the final element calculation should include the time dependent development of the frozen soil body. Um, we must be able to calculate and use the average frozen soil's temperature uh, to prove the to understand what the time dependent parameter is going to be. And that's also important because that's those are things that we want to measure during during construction. It's also very important for scheduling to understand the freeze time. And we also use these calculations to optimize the freeze pipe arrangement and the freezing operations. Um, we look at time dependent temperature distributions in the soil. Uh, we determine energy consumption and Based on that, we design the capacity of the refrigeration plant for brine freeze. <coughs> These are some typical examples of the results of finite element analysis conducted on several projects. <coughs> uh, Emma, perhaps you want to talk a little bit about um, these sections? Yep, I can do. So hello to everybody from Germany. Uh, I'm lucky that at least half of the audience is from Europe, so they might be able to understand my strange accent. <laughs> so, okay, now we are talking about the ground freezing design, the thermal design. Uh, here are just some examples for calculation results. You can see on the left side a cross section through a frozen tunnel. This is not a, a cross passage tunnel. This is a, a normal tunnel being driven in Berlin for the project of the U55. Um, and what you usually get, you get the uh, temperature uh, contour lines at a certain time showing what is the temperature distribution in the soil, and based on that, you can estimate uh, the average temperature of the frozen soil, which is, of course, a very important for the strength of the frozen soil. So these calculations are really needed uh, to cover also the structural design to show that the strength which has been assumed in the structural design can really be achieved with the freeze pipe layout of this freeze system uh, which is planned. On the right side, you see a typical application for cross passages, uh, ground freezing, um, as I will explain later. The freeze pipe usually will be drilled only from one tunnel side to the opposite side, and then the major uh, task is to get a watertight connection on the opposite tunnel, as you can see here. In some cases, um, it is required to add additional cooling on these opposite, uh, opposite sides, and these calculations help to figure out if that additional cooling is required or not. So I'm coming to the next slide. Oh.
can uh, do a left click on the fly first helmet and then try your keyboard again. Right. Okay, sorry. 